I am your MC for today. I am William Lorenzo. Um, I would like to ask Father Elijah Pantorega of the Franciscan Conventuals and the head of the Militia Immaculata to welcome all of you today. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Father Elijah. I, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, that historical uh, uh, episode that really did take place and uh, was uh, recorded by St. Maximilian Colby. Freemasonry is the enemy of the Church. Pope Leo XIII declared that to unmask Freemasonry is to defeat it. So, the first thing we must understand on the human level, in the war with Freemasonry, it must be unmasked and shown for what it is. Because all too often it is now being said, all oh, Catholics may become Freemasons. There is no longer any uh, enmity between Freemasonry and the Church. And they're looking for coexistence. They're looking for a modus vivendi. They're even looking for uh, a way that the Church and Freemasonry can collaborate and work together. But if you understand what Freemasonry is, you will know that it is impossible. Freemasonry and the Catholic Church remain eternally at war with each other in a war to the death. And when we expose what Freemasonry is, then we know that it cannot be any, anything different. In fact, at just about every religious point, Freemasonry and Catholicism are in disagreement. They are in agreement on one point. Regardless of what some of the more uh, misinformed clergy are saying, regardless of what some of the more misinformed Freemasons are saying, those in the highest positions of authority in the Church and those in the highest positions in Freemasonry are in total agreement that there is a war to the death between Freemasonry and the Catholic Church. In his book, the Anti-Christian Revolution de Freimaugerkeit, that is the Anti-Christian Revolution of Freemasonry, Father Manfred Adler quotes one of the Grand Masters of Freemasonry, who explains that it is in the very nature of Catholicism and Freemasonry that they are at odds with each other. They are at war with each other. And if we want to understand why, it is no mystery. A great scholar of many books who during the reign of Pope Pius XII worked uh, in the Holy Office, Father Dennis Bakke, the Irish Holy Ghost Father, in his lectures to his students in the seminary repeated many times, Freemasonry is implacably opposed to the triune God. We look in the Old Testament, for example, and we see that there is one true religion there are many false religions. And what distinguishes them is that the one true religion worships the Most High God, Almighty God, the Creator of Heaven and Earth. As Melchizedek, the priest, confessed his faith in the presence to, to the patriarch Abraham. It is important that we bear this in mind that St. Gregory the Great says there has only been one church throughout all history. 
from the time of Abel until the, until the time of the very last member of the elect of Jesus Christ at the end of the world. It is one church. That's what our Lord Jesus Christ meant when he said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. This is the continuity that there is. The church of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the church of the New Testament. And so in the time of the prophets, there was an open and declared war between the false religions, the false gods, and the one true religion of the one true God. And so it is no surprise when we look in and read through the New Testament, we find it is exactly the same situation. There is only one true religion, and that is the religion of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Catholic religion which professes the Catholic faith. All other religions are false. Even those that call themselves Christian, as Pope St. Pius V explains in his Catechism that all of the other churches are inspired by the devil and they lead souls to perdition. So we have war between religions because we ultimately worship different gods. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament teach us that the gods of the pagans are devils. And even those who in Christian times formulated the heresies, they were inspired by the devil and many of them in fact were secretly following the religion of the false gods. The ancient, his, the, the ancient heresy of Gnosticism, for example, has always, ever since it invaded the church, it has masqueraded as being somehow Christian. But when you examine their doctrines, their notion of God, their idea of God is different than that of a Christian God. The God of the Old and the God of the New Testament. This is the fundamental difference. The God of sacred scripture, the God of the prophets, the God of the, of the apostles, the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ is an almighty, infinitely perfect, omniscient God who created the world out of nothing. God spoke and the heavens were made. The other idea of God is not a transcendent God, but an imminent God. And that is the God of Freemasonry. Not the almighty, infinitely perfect and eternal creator of heaven and earth, with everything in the world and everything in the universe. But the God who is the constitutive soul of all that exists. The eternal principle 
of an eternal world. As I said, quoting Father Dennis Fahey, Freemasonry is implacably opposed to the transcendent God. Their God is different. Their God is no God. So, having understood this most basic <laughs> distinction between Freemasonry and Catholicism, we can understand why they are forever at war with each other and it is a war to the death. Predictably, and thanks be to God, we need not wonder whose death it will be. Our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated the power of his divinity when he rose from the tomb. He rose from the dead and he promised to his apostles who he sent with the commission on the mission to preach the holy gospel to all nations of the world, make disciples of all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And he said, I am with you all days, even until the end of the world. And he said to St. Peter, Thou art Peter, the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. So no matter how much it may at one point in time appear that the gates of hell are prevailing against the church, and how it may, for some brief time in history, appear that the church has disappeared, as if it has been replaced by a new, a new church of a new religion. We recall our Lord's promise that the gates of hell will not prevail, and we recall also, He says, Behold, I told you this all in advance. This is the first thing that Catholics must not do is to be scandalized when they see the church engulfed by a great crisis. And the great crisis that seems to threaten the very life of the church, to threaten the, the life of the church to the point of extinction, is that revolution, the, quote the title of that book again by Father Manfred Adler, the anti-Christian revolution of Freemasonry. But even if it shall appear that the church is destroyed and no longer exists, and that a new religion of a new church has taken its place, our Lord Jesus Christ said, Behold, I've told you this all in advance. Our blessed Savior said, he will shorten those days because the, the deception will be so great that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. Because that is what St. Paul calls the mystery of iniquity. The operation of error. Now, it is the purpose of one who speaks error in order to deceive. And the one whose purpose is to deceive, of course, is the one that I say here called the father of lies. So when we see the operation of error reach the point of its culmination it is at that point that we must not despair but our, even our Lord Jesus Christ said it's time for you to jump for joy because your redemption is at hand so the first thing we, we need not fear that the Church of Jesus Christ the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church can ever be destroyed. 
But we have to be aware that the operation of error, which is the workings of the mystery of iniquity, is well underway. And the Freemasonry is the, is the one that is promoting it, prompting it, and carrying it out for that purpose to destroy the Catholic religion from the face of the earth, to destroy faith in Jesus Christ from the face of the earth, and to replace it with a new religion. A religion, as they say, on which all men can agree. And so they want to reform Christianity entirely into what they call a dogma-free Christianity. Dogma-free Christianity, which means you can profess your belief in Jesus Christ, but there is no dogma that defines who and what he is. Now, the Catholic religion is a dogmatic religion. And we say it is a dogmatic religion because God reveals doctrine, the doctrine of the faith. It is the faith, as St. Thomas Aquinas explains, which is the first thing that unites us to God. He is the primary truth. He is the, the infinite, essential, subsistent truth. And so our Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the revelation of the Father. And so our Lord tells us that it is not by bread alone that man lives, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Religion cannot be reduced to mere human works of charity, of almsgiving, because man lives first and foremost by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so the first question we ask is, what must I believe to be saved? And the Church has taught us down through the ages for 2,000 years we must believe everything that God has revealed. What God has revealed in sacred scripture and the sacred tradition, and which has been set forth by the magisterium of the church authoritatively for us to believe. Because this is what God reveals to us and commands to us that we must believe his word, we must believe what he has revealed about himself in order to be saved. That is what is so important about dogma. God revealed the mysteries of our faith because these mysteries are the mysteries of our salvation. Without faith in divine revelation, we cannot be saved. Because God, God is a transcendent, eternal, infinitely perfect God. The pure act of being in which there is no potentiality and no imperfection. And being infinitely perfect, He created us out of nothing. He is the source and origin of all created good because He is the uncreated good. He is the source of all truth because He is the uncreated and infinite truth. And therefore it is only by adhering to Him that we can be saved. And the first thing that unites us to God is that which unites us to the primary truth which is Himself. And that's why faith is called the theological virtue. And the theological virtues are what unite us to God. And first and foremost, faith. And that's why St. Paul says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So our Christian religion, the religion of the one holy Catholic Church, 
is the religion of faith. First and foremost, belief in divine revelation. And what God has revealed are the divine truths about himself, the divine mysteries that transcend the power of our human mind, and the commandments that God expects us to obey because he commands us under penalty of eternal damnation if we turn away from him and reject his commandments. He promises us eternal life if we obey his commandments because we must love God above all things. So Jesus says in the Gospel of St. John, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is our religion. And this is what separates us from all the other religions. Freemasonry will eliminate the revealed mysteries which are the very substance of the dogmas of our faith. They claim that this is what divides men. This is what calls, causes strife and wars because people believe in different religions and make different claims as to what God has revealed. And so they are at, at war with each other. And so we must focus on what unites and not what divides. Mm -hmm. We must focus on what we all have in common. This is the lie, the deception of Freemasonry. Because there is only one God, as St. Maximilian Kolbe said, if there is only one God, there can only be one true religion. As St. Paul says, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And there is no salvation outside of that faith. Do we want peace on earth and an eternity of hell? Or are we willing to suffer? in order to uphold the divinely revealed truth, revealed by God through His only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have shown us the way, of course, are the martyrs. It is a practice I recommend to everyone. Read the Roman Martyrology every day. This will tell you also who is going to win this war between God and his adversaries? So many times you read of the saints who were martyred for having simply blown and the big stone idol falls to the ground he crumbles into thousands of little pieces. <coughs> God allows those holy men and women to be brutally tortured and killed for their faith. But he manifests his almighty power in the martyrs. How many times they made unsuccessful attempts at killing the martyrs, feed them to the wild beasts, but the wild beasts refused to eat them burn them with fire, but the fire won't burn them. St. John the Apostle was put into a cauldron of boiling oil, and he came out uncooked. So even when driven by rage to the desperate means where God finally allows them to be to be killed. This is what St. Alphonsus calls the victory of the martyrs and what the church has always considered the crowning glory of the martyrs because they were victorious in the profession of their faith. They confessed that faith to the shedding of their blood.
So they have shown us the way, the only way. Because as much as there is the new Masonic heresy that has invaded the church, and that is called ecumenism, Pope Pius XI in his encyclical Mortalium Animos declared that ecumenism will destroy, ecumenism would destroy the church down to its very foundation. In other words, it would raise it to the ground of that great edifice of the church built upon the rock which is Peter. Ecumenism, the child of Freemasonry, would, uh, would destroy the church and just demolish it right down to its foundation stone, which would mean, which would mean wipe it off the face of the earth if it could, if it had the power, and if it were to be allowed to run its course to the end. That is ecumenism. Our Lady, the Mother of the Church, is the enemy of ecumenism. St. Maximilian Colby wrote that ecumenism is the enemy of the Immaculata. And she, of course, is the very prototype of the Church as the ancient fathers teach. Ecumenism is the mortal enemy of the church and it is the creation of Freemasonry. And it is ecumenism that says we must focus on what unites us all, what unites religions together and not pay attention to what divides us. We must seek brotherhood and peace among men of different religions. We mustn't be trying to persuade them to, to persuade them to abandon their religion and embrace our religion because it is the, the doctrine the doctrine of Freemasonry summed up by the man who was elected nearly two years ago who said proselytism is solemn nonsense. Jesus Christ said make disciples of all nations. Preach the gospel to every creature. Make disciples of all nations. That's what we call proselytism to preach your religion to the non-believer so that they will embrace that saving faith in Jesus Christ. Because there is salvation only in that faith and in no other. And so that souls may be saved, our Lord Jesus Christ commanded his disciples to preach that gospel and make disciples of the whole world. Freemasonry says, no! That causes division. That sets people against each other. That is destructive of peace. It causes people to fight with each other. So don't do it. We must seek what unites and not what divides. That is the teaching of Freemasonry. We must not proselytize because that is what causes religious wars. That's what Freemasonry teaches. And this man who calls himself Francis says, proselytism is solemn nonsense. So where did this Francis Pergozio get his doctrine from? He got it from Freemasonry. Freemasonry, which is the implacable enemy of the, of the transcendent God, the implacable enemy of the Catholic Church. And Jorge Pergozio is teaching that doctrine, not which is of the church, 
but which is of the enemies of the church. What does our Lord Jesus Christ have to say on this question? You read in the Gospel of St. Matthew and in the Gospel of St. Luke. Think not that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. He's not come to unite. Our Lord says not, he's not come to unite, but to divide. Not to bring peace, but to bring the sword, to bring war. What war is this? It's the war between truth and falsehood, between good and evil, between God and the devil. We see in almost every page of sacred scripture, read through, first of all, read through the Old Testament. And through every book of the Old Testament, we see set before our eyes, we read of this war between God and his enemies. True religion and false religion. And we read in the 8th chapter of the prophet Ezekiel, how even the ancients of Israel in the temple of God were performing acts of worship that were pagan work, that were acts of pagan worship. The kind of worship that is performed in the, the temples, the lodges of Freemasonry to this very day. There is the unforgettable image of the prophet Elijah and the prophet, the prophets of Baal, Baal, the false god, the arch enemy of the God of Israel. Now, the word Baal, the full name of that false god, Baalzebul, which is translated the Lord of the world, the Prince of the Earth. When our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of the devil, he referred to him as the Prince of this world. He's taking that Old Testament name of the pagan god of the Canaanites. God commanded the Israelites to enter the land of Palestine and to annihilate those pagans because they were so abominable in the sight of God. The Jewish people were a moral miracle. In this great ocean of paganism, well, they believed in many different gods, but they believed in an ultimate principle of good and evil that was the constitutive force constituting an eternal world. This is the ancient paganism, and this is what modern Freemason recalls the ancient mysteries. You can ask any Freemason what is the religion of Freemasonry and they will tell you it is the ancient mysteries. Now it was for me and I suppose it was for many of us when we were young and we were children and we first started to read the, read the Bible and we read about this ancient world where people are worshiping false gods and idols there's Baal, there's uh, so many, so many others, Dagon, there are so many other gods with strange names. And as young Catholics, we thought, well, this is something, such a strange, different world that we live in today than, than they lived in in those days. Moloch, 
After all, you don't see a temple of Moloch on, on, in every corner. You don't find shrines and sanctuaries of Moloch of Baal here and there in, a, in, in, in any Christian country. Or you don't think so. But in the temples of Freemasonry, they worship those false gods. Of course, in the pagan countries, you go to India, for example, and you still see plenty of shrines and temples to the pagan gods. But you think that this is something foreign to the modern world, but it is something that has always been there. It is hidden. Because Freemasonry, as Father Elijah was mentioning, its modern Freemasonry was instituted in the year 1717. Now that came about when there was the merger between speculative Freemasonry and the Hermetic Lodges. The Hermetic Lodges were lodges of Gnosticism, which were that occult pagan mysteries that were invading the church, masquerading itself as Christian. But really, it was those ancient mysteries just uh, pretending, as it were, to be Christian, but not really. Interestingly, even Protestantism was inspired by Gnosticism. Martin Luther, who was considered to be, of course, the founder of the Protestant religion. There are many different shades of Protestantism, but the first Protestant is Martin Luther. And in his writings, not his published writings, but in his own handwriting, in his own copies of the works of St. Augustine, you see he writes in the margins what his true beliefs are. And he was a hermetic Gnostic, believing in those ancient mysteries. This was uh, uncovered uh, and published in a book by Father Theobald Baer, uh, a German scholar. So the dogmatic theologian of the early Lutheran Church understood this, that Luther's own beliefs were a threat to Lutheranism. And so he purged Lutheran doctrine of what he called Luther's Manichaean delirium. St. Augustine, before his conversion, had been a Manichaean, believing in the dual principle that eternally constitutes the substance of the world. And they preferred the philosophy of Plato to explain the cosmology of their pagan occult mystical beliefs. And so that is why Martin Luther in his Protestantism as an Augustinian friar continued to wear the mask of one who professes the Augustinian theology. Yet the very basis of the new religion of Martin Luther is not the theology of St. Augustine, but the Gnosticism of Hermes Trismegistus. Again and again, you see the heretics who lean in that direction toward the pagan, mystic, pagan mysticism, which is the very soul of the Jewish Kabbalism, completely distinct from the, from the ancient Jewish, Jewish faith of the Israelites. You will always see that these heretics look toward St. Augustine, because St. Augustine's theology was platonically based, not like St. Thomas. 
the philosophical basis for the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas was far more scientific, systematic, uh, based in the doctrine of Aristotle. So Cornelius Jansen, the heretic, who does he appeal to as the authority for this heretical system of belief? St. Augustine. His magnum opus was, the title of his book was Augustinus. So the heretics love to hide behind that mask of St. Augustine and really at root of their doctrine is a Platonic philosophy which is not the Christianized Platonism of St. Augustine but a return to the pagan Neo-Platonism of the apostates who rejected Christianity and returned to the to the Greek mystery religions such as Plotinus and uh, Plotinus, excuse me, uh, Porphyry Porphyry who was very vehemently anti-Christian I uh, again, I every really name was Porphyry Plotinus was a big Christian uh, philosopher and uh, no, no place in, in that scheme of things So in, the, in that Platonic philosophy is wrapped up the idea as it is presented by Gnosticism, which is the eternity of the world constituted of the dual principles of good and evil. And this is what Hilaire Belloc referred to as the permanent trouble of the human mind. We see this again and again. Uh, after the early persecutions of the church by the pagans, there was Julian the Apostate who renounced Christianity, persecuted the church, but eventually, at the time, at the time of Constantine the Great, the church was freed the persecutions ended and eventually under Emperor Theodosius the Catholic Church became the official church of the Empire and those Manichaeans were eventually banished into the Balkan states where they survived up until the time of the Middle Ages and then during the time of the Crusades The, some of the crusaders were infected with that error and they brought it back into Europe and those errors resurfaced again in a new form of Manichaeanism which was known as Tatarism and Albigensianism but it was always the same doctrine and it was being promoted secretly by the Jews one might ask why the Jews? Because in that time, as to this very day, Judaism is infected with Kabbalism. And Kabbalism is like Gnosticism that invaded the church as a heresy and masqueraded itself, pretending to be Christian. Well, so in pre-Christian times, those pagans invaded and infiltrated with their ideas. They infected the Jews with their ideas and thus their paganism infiltrated into the religion, the true religion of the ancient Israelites. And so this is, a, this is truly the permanent trouble of the human mind, the permanent heresy that resurfaces again and again in different forms. And this ancient system of belief is the basis of all modern philosophy.
the thing that distinguishes modern philosophy from the from the philosophy of perennis, the, the perennial, eternal philosophy, is the same thing that distinguishes the ancient beliefs from the Christian beliefs that followed them. The Christian philosophy professes its belief in the transcendent triune God, the creator of the world, who created the world out of nothing. The ancient error is the same as the modern error, which professes the material universe to be eternal. And there is no principle that is extrinsic from it. And if, though, if there is to be understood some divine principle, it is a God within. In modern times, this was first most clearly formulated by Baruch Spinoza, the excommunicated Jew, even, even the Jewish synagogue expels him for the unorthodoxy of his beliefs. And he formulated the notion of God as, in this manner. And considering what I said about the ancient, the ancient beliefs, the, the ancient mystery, the Platonic philosophy of the pagans, it's all summed up in this one expression which defines the Spinozan God. Deus sive natura. God or nature. That God and nature both with the capital N because God and nature for Spinoza are one. This is the very soul of modern philosophy. So much so that one of the most prominent of modern philosophers, Hegel, went so far as to say that one who is not a Spinozan may not call himself a philosopher. That is the basic ideology of the modern mind that opposes all that we call God. We look in the book of the Apocalypse of St. John and Antichrist opposes everything that is called God. It is a whole new idea of God, which is really, in fact, resurrecting the ancient pagan idea of God. And it is that religion, that false, demonic, inspired religion based on the ancient mysteries of paganism, which invades and infiltrates into the Catholic Church for the purpose of destroying that is their professed aim, their professed end. So they want to transform the Catholic Church into a Christianity without dogmas. That is their own formulation. Christianity, dogma-free Christianity. Because they do not believe in a transcendent God who speaks through prophets, through the apostles, and through the incarnate word, of God our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of their very idea of God, God within, the God who animates the universe, the, the anima mundi, the world soul, God speaks in nature and through nature according to their religious beliefs. And that is why they are opposed to divine commandments. Specific cut and dry dogmas of faith because they reject the very principle of a supernaturally revealed mystery, a 
super, supernaturally revealed dogmas revealed by an infinitely perfect and transcendent God that is totally at variance with the idea of the God within. And so you have to experience God. And revelation is something that is ongoing. Revelation for them is something that happens every day. Now we find the curious formulation of Jorge Pergolio when he says, I do not believe in a Catholic God. A rather shocking thing for a man who wears the papal attire. Those were his words. I do not believe in a Catholic God. And then more recently, he made a qualified statement. He's not professing a radical atheism, but he said a certain kind of God doesn't exist. And he said, you say you believe in God, but I'm going to tell you something. God does not exist. And he repeated himself, God does not exist. What is he talking about? I do not believe in a Catholic God. It is that notion of a God, he says, that doesn't exist. This is something quite radical. When he says God does not exist, he's saying the Catholic God doesn't exist. He believes in a different kind of God. So what kind of God does he believe in? He does not believe in a God who dictates to the human race specific commandments. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. Thou shalt make holy the Sabbath day. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. Those are very specific commands, cut and dry. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, when he asked him, when the man asked him, what must I do, what must I do to be saved? Jesus said, you must obey the commandments. After Jorge Bergoglio was elected and began to wear the papal garb, let's recall what he said, strongly suggesting that even atheists can be saved. But remember what I said earlier, what is the first and foremost, the first and foremost requirement for salvation? Faith. Faith. And faith means to believe everything, to believe all that God has revealed and that has been set forth and followed by the church for us to believe. If we were to reject just one single article of faith, then we have no faith anymore. We lose the virtue of faith because we reject thereby the authority of the revealing God. So you can say, I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator, have creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ is the only Son, our Lord, uh, was crucified, died, and was buried, he ascended into heaven, he sits at the right hand of God, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Oh, but I don't believe he was born of a virgin. Well, if you say that, if you say, if you say, I don't believe he was born of a virgin, even that's only one point you disagree on, you cease to be a member of the Catholic Church because you have no faith. You don't have the Catholic faith. Because to have the faith, you must believe everything that God has revealed. Jesus says you must, be, you must obey the commandments to be saved. We read this in the Gospel. It's very explicit. And as Catholics, we believe His Word. Because Jesus Christ hypostatically united to the divinity in his very person he is the mouthpiece of the invisible eternal God and it is on his divine authority he tells us we must obey the commandments what did Francis say you have to do what you believe is right 
and avoid what you believe is wrong. We find this principle already advanced in Gaudium et Spes of Vatican II. Scandalously, the principle is announced, and any Catholic Pope would have condemned it immediately. As soon as this principle is formulated, it is to be denounced and condemned because it is absolutely opposed to our Catholic faith. The idea that modern men want to be responsible in their own conscience and through their conscience to understand what is right and wrong and understand what are their duties. In my book, The Suicide of Altering the Faith and the Liturgy, you'll find the precise quotation and the precise reference. Let me quote that one because that was uh, a very noticeable uh, principle of Masonic belief that actually found its way into that document of the Second Vatican Council. And this is the teaching of Bergoglio. You do what you believe is right. You avoid what you believe is wrong, and that's how you are saved. And he dispenses with the whole, the, the entire need for, the absolute need to profess the Catholic faith. St. Paul says, without faith it is impossible to please God. The church teaches in the First Vatican Council's profession of faith there is no salvation outside of the Catholic faith. We must believe what God has revealed. We must accept the, re we must accept the authority of the revealing God. If we are going to save our souls and go to heaven and avoid hell, we must believe what God has revealed and we must believe on His authority. We are not free to decide for ourselves what we think is right and what we think is wrong and to follow our conscience according to what we think is right, what we judge is wrong. God does not grant us the right to make that judgment. God requires obedience. We must humble ourselves, as St. Peter says, humble yourself before the hand of Almighty God. We must be subject. We must be subject and therefore in obedience to God, in obedience to His commandments. We must believe what He has revealed and we must obey His commandments. There is absolutely no other way to be saved. That is the way to salvation, the only way, and there is no other. Then there was the woman who wrote the letter to Francis, explaining that she was married in the church, divorced, and civilly remarried. Francis speaks to her on the phone and tells her, yes, she may, she may receive Holy Communion. This man, who is supposed to be the Pope of the Catholic Church, is telling this woman that she may receive sacrilegious communion. He doesn't believe it's a sacrilege. And just a couple of days ago, after a woman from Spain had written a letter to him, explaining that explaining the circumstances of her life she was born, she was a girl as a baby. She grew up hating her gender. She thought that she should be a man. And so finally she made the very radical decision of undergoing surgery, had her breasts removed, and she is living in a lesbian relationship with another woman. 
she writes to Francis, she sends a letter to the Vatican, Francis reads the letter and, and calls her on the phone, made two attempts and finally reached her and invited her to come into the Vatican and to meet with him. The scandal of this is the fact that this is, according to the teaching of the Church, an abomination. Her parish priest calls her the daughter of the devil. A public sinner committing the sin that calls to heaven for vengeance. The sin against nature. And Francis invites her and her lesbian lover to meet with him in the Vatican. Never a word of condemnation. If you want to be compassionate, you don't condemn the person, you condemn the sin. But you admonish them for, this, for the good of their soul, that they must abandon their sinful ways and return to God in repentance. The Bergoglio does exactly the opposite. How many times you see him photographed and he's displaying the so-called gay colors. And then he is in Rome, seen in public, holding hands with the priest, walking and holding hands with the priest, who is a gay activist, a notorious gay activist. This is, this is not a rumor. A notorious gay activist priest. And they're walking together and holding hands. This is a man who, through his actions, even though he, he doesn't come out and say homosexuality is not a sin, but through his actions, he clearly demonstrates, he clearly is saying that, don't worry, it's all right, it's not a sin. And then he very guilefully will take one step back as they say, two steps forward, one step back. And then he will make some lip service to the church's teaching and say, well, we still uphold the teaching of the church uh, uh, regarding homosexuality. But they'll never come out and explicitly condemn it as evil, as wrong, as abominable. Because he is promoting this. And this, this tells us one thing. When the church teaches infallibly in faith and morals, the church's doctrine on sexual morality is infallible. And it is the teaching of sacred scripture. And Jorge Bergoglio is directly opposing it in his actions. He's defying the authority of God. by inviting a lesbian couple into the Vatican. Public sinners, and he condones it entirely, not one expression that this is wrong. He tells the woman living in adultery that she may receive Holy Communion. This tells you that he does not believe in those commandments. He doesn't believe them. So he doesn't believe that God has revealed these commandments. And when he says, I don't believe in a Catholic God, his notion of God is not the Christian God. He believes in some other kind of God. Why can I say this? Because, as our Lord Jesus Christ said in the Gospel, He's condemned out of his own mouth. He is condemned by the words of his own mouth. He has made very clear that his belief system is something different than what we believe as Catholics. And it just so happens that his belief system, not believing in a Catholic God, when he says God does not exist, God is not a spray, in other words, the kind of God you believe in, the God there who's watching down on you and can hear you. No. He says, I don't believe in that kind of God. I don't believe in that Catholic God. He believes in that God within. 
a God that you can communicate with through experience, through personal experience and intuition, you can feel His presence. This is the hallmark of Gnostic belief, which is the doctrine of Freemasonry. So I don't have to endeavor to bring proofs, documentation that Jorge Bergoglio is a member of the Freemasonic sect. What is clear from his own mouth is that his beliefs are Masonic and not Christian. Now some people ask me, well, how can you how can you reconcile this idea with the dogma of the indefectibility of the papacy? And I I've heard this question put to me so many times and I always put back I always put it back to the people. Well, first of all, how do you explain that this opposes the dogma of indefectibility? You see, people who speak that way, people who ask this kind of question, have a very fundamentalistic, a very oversimplified idea, a very untheologically developed idea about the papacy and about the indefectibility of the papacy. When you look at the, the doctors of the church and, and the popes, what the popes have said, what the popes have taught, what the doctors of the church have taught, Pope Adrian VI even mentioned that there have been popes who were heretics. St. Robert Bellamin speaks of what is to be done if a pope becomes a heretic. St. Antoninus also. St. Alphonsus. The great theologians such as Suarez, the great canonists like Coronata, they all deal with this question and they all have various approaches how the church would, would deal with this kind of a problem. When there is a pope who is teaching something that is clearly and manifestly against the doctrine of the Catholic faith, the fundamentalists will either take it one or the other way. They will blindly say, the sea is sacred, there's no pope. As soon as the pope teaches that, you know he's no longer the pope. We've all, I think we've all heard of people like this. This is, this is the Sedevicantus movement. And as I always say, Sedevicantus are prone to this kind of fundamentalism. But then there's the other side, the papalitors, the pope worshippers. And they will say, no, it's impossible for a pope to be teaching heresy. Because that would mean the church is defected. Well, if I may quote the principle of St. Augustine, which is quote also of St. Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas, which is part of the church's tradition, contra factum non est argumentum, against the fact there can be no argument. Does Jorge Bergoglio teach heresy? Yes, of course he does. In his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. Francis teaches that the covenant that God made with the Jewish people was never revoked. And to support this theoretical teaching, he quotes a premise that has no logical significance to the question. The conclusion is a non sequitur. It does not logically follow. He says, no, it was never revoked. The covenant was never revoked. Because the promise that God made to Abraham is irrevocable. The problem with Bergoglio's uh, doctrine on that point is this. The promise that God made to Abraham is indeed irrevocable. But 
the covenant of the, the Jewish covenant was indeed revoked. It doesn't matter whether the promise made to Abraham can be revoked or not. Does not change the fact at all that the old covenant is revoked. This is a dogma of the Catholic faith. The old covenant is revoked. So we ask the question, what is the old covenant? Is it the covenant that God made with Abraham? Is it the covenant that God made uh, with, with David, with King David? Both of those covenants were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. They find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The promise made to Abraham, the promise made to David, are irrevocable and fulfilled in Christ. Neither of those covenants, for example, are ever revoked because they are replaced by a new covenant. So St. Paul teaches that the covenant that God made with the Jewish people, with their fathers, on Mount Sinai, the covenant mediated by Moses. So St. Paul is very specific. He's talking about the Mosaic covenant of Mount Sinai. He says that covenant is the old covenant because it is made void by Christ. And in the letter to the Hebrews, he explains further. Commenting on the words of the prophet Jeremiah. It is made old by that which is new. It's called the old covenant because it's replaced by the new covenant. If there were not a new covenant, it wouldn't be called the old covenant. It would be what the Jews call it down to this very day. The Jews call it the covenant. It's not old. For them it's not old because the Jews think it's still in force. It is the Catholic dogma. We call it the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, the Jewish Covenant. It's the Old Covenant because, as St. Paul teaches, it is made old by the New Covenant. And what is made old is, is coming to its end. It's coming to its extinction. This is what St. Paul teaches. And so, St. Paul says, it is made void by Christ, St. Paul to the Corinthians. So there's no mystery here why the ancient fathers unanimously teach that that old covenant is the Mosaic covenant. That's the old covenant. It's not any other covenant. It's the Mosaic covenant because that's the only covenant that is made old by the new covenant. But the ancient fathers teach unanimously that the Mosaic Covenant is the Old Covenant. It's made void by Christ. The Ecumenical Council of Florence infallibly defines that that covenant, the coming of Christ, that covenant ceased. And quoting the Ecumenical Council of Florence, Pope Benedict XIV, in his encyclical Ex Quo Primum, declares repeatedly that that Mosaic Covenant is no longer in force. It is abrogated. It is, abrogate, it, it, is, it is abrogated. It is abolished. It is revoked. Nothing could be more clear. The Old Covenant is revoked. Gordon Bergoglio teaches that the Old Covenant was never, the Old Covenant the, the Mosaic Covenant, he says, he says specifically, the covenant that God made with the Jews was not revoked. That is directly opposed to the defined dogma of the Catholic faith. This is heresy.
This crisis in the church, however, did not begin with Jorge Bergoglio. You look in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which was published uh, under the pontificate by the authority of Pope John Paul II, you will find that same teaching that the Old Covenant was never revoked. That is heresy. You cannot believe that and still call yourself a Catholic. And yet we have a catechism that calls itself the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaching that heresy. Again, how do we know it's heresy? As I said at the very beginning, Catholicism is a dogmatic religion. It's a revealed religion. A transcendent, infinitely perfect, almighty, all-knowing God revealed the divine mysteries, the divine truths that we must believe to be saved. And one of those dogmatic truths defined solemnly by the Church as an article of Catholic faith is that the Old Covenant, the Jewish Covenant of Moses, is revoked. It was foretold by the prophet Jeremiah that it would be revoked. It is announced by St. Paul that it is revoked. It is taught by the ancient fathers that it is revoked. And it is taught by the popes up until the Second Vatican Council that it is revoked. This is, if I may use the formulation of, of the great doctor of the Church, St. Athanasius, the actual original faith, teaching, and tradition of the Church which the Lord bestowed, the apostles proclaimed, and the fathers safeguarded. How can it be that after the Second Vatican Council, they proclaimed the heresy of ecumenism, the doctrine which is the child of Freemasonry, founded on the, on the idea that every human person has the right in human dignity to follow the religion of one's own conscience, that this is the right before God that you follow the religion of your own conscience. And because you have the right to follow the religion of your own conscience, there is the right to profess, to practice, to preach, to propagate whatever religion you believe is right according to your own conscience. This doctrine was infallibly condemned by Pope Pius IX in his Syllabus of Errors because he solemnly imposed this, these condemnations on all Catholics throughout the world. So he is teaching the whole church that all Catholics must hold this error condemned. And even according to the Code of Canon Law, I believe it's Canon 751 of the new section of that canon that was added by Pope John Paul II, that such doctrines are infallible. <coughs> Yet Vatican II is teaching the condemned error of ecumenism, the condemned heresy of religious liberty. And as Father Johannes Durban, the theology professor from the University of Münster and the University of Paderborn, uh, who wrote three volumes analyzing the, the doctrine of Pope John Paul II, and he went beyond just the ecumenism of John Paul II but went into the ecumenism of the Second Vatican Council and explained that a new liturgy had to be devised because with the new teachings of the Second Vatican Council there was a glaring discrepancy. You had the old faith, the old religion professed in the Roman, the traditional Roman liturgy, but you had these new doctrines being given expression in the documents of the Second Vatican Council, the decree on religious liberty, the decree on the decree on ecumenism. And so to accommodate the change in doctrine, they had to devise a new liturgy that does that, that teaches the new doctrines and does not contradict the new doctrines. 
And so they saw fit to the ones who drew up the documents saw fit to proclaim what would become a liturgical reform. The council fathers, the bishops were not suspecting that anything such as such a radical revolution was planned in the in the liturgical revision called called for in the constitution on the liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium. Archbishop Robert Dwyer said this was beyond our wildest beliefs. And yet, what was beyond their wildest beliefs actually materialized in the new rite of mass of Pope Paul VI. And the men who devised the new liturgy said it reflects a new theology, a new Eucharistic theology. And again, an idea, just how radical the new liturgy of Paul VI is, it took elements straight out of Protestantism. In the old Mass, the sacred host is placed on the corporal. This is clearly what is done in the offering of the eternal sacrifice of the Mass. But the idea of the Mass, not as a propitiatory oblation, not as a sacrifice, but as a commemorative meal, like commemorating the Last Supper, the Lord with His disciples. They give it the idea of a communal meal. It was Martin Luther who took the bread and placed it on the pattern. So in the offertory of the new rite of Mass of Paul VI, the priest places the host not directly on the corporal, but on a paten, because a meal is eaten off of a plate. A sacrifice is offered on the corporal. And it would no longer be the high altar that we had in the, in the, in the traditional churches, but under Freemasonic inspiration, they were already building churches for the new rite of mass in the 1950s waiting for the day that a new Mass would be instituted. I remember when my Franciscan friend, Father Antonio, was reading to me documents from the 1920s coming straight from the lodges of Freemasonry, proposing certain changes to be made in the liturgy of the Mass, exactly those changes made by Pope Paul VI in the new rite of Mass. We find so many Protestant elements worked into the new liturgy, as I explained in my book briefly, The Suicide of Authoring the Faith in the Liturgy. Other authors have gone more deeply into the Protestantization of the, of the, of the liturgy of the Holy Mass. Our Lady of Fatima, in the Third Secret, warned. She said, do not be diluting the Mass bringing these other elements into the Mass. Do not change the liturgy of the Mass. And she foretold that there would be an evil council. Those were the Blessed Virgin Mary's words, Our Lady of Fatima. She, she foretold that there would be this evil council. And she wanted the secret to be revealed in the year 1960. I know this to be a fact because Father Ingo Dollinger, Dr. Dollinger, who was a long time uh, uh, spiritual son of Padre Pio, also for decades a close friend of Cardinal Ratzinger uh, in, and the Pope Benedict XVI. He spoke about this freely and openly with his seminarians. He was the rector of Immaculate Heart of Mary Seminary in Annapolis, Brazil. The young priests and deacons spoke to me about this, what Father Dollinger revealed, what Cardinal Ratzinger had revealed to Father Dollinger. And I spoke with Father Dollinger myself, and he told me about his encounter with Cardinal, Cardinal Ratzinger, after the third secret was supposedly fully revealed on June the 26th for the year 2000.
Dolliger told me, I confronted Ratzinger to his face. They had time celebrated the Mass, and after the Mass, removing the vestments, and that's when he confronted Cardinal Ratzinger. Because in 1991, nine years earlier, Cardinal Ratzinger had mentioned those specific details. Our Lady warned not to change the Mass. She warned of the evil counsel. She spoke specifically of the conciliar popes, as she spoke of the conciliar popes in very negative, critical terms. And so when the secret was supposedly revealed, none of those details came out in that version of the secret that was revealed in June of 2000. And that is what Dollinger confronted Ratzinger with, that discrepancy. Cardinal Ratzinger was cornered, and so he blurted out, Wirklich gibt es da noch etwas? Really, there's more to it, there's more there. Literally, truly there is more there. He admitted that there is more to the secret than what was revealed. So someone might ask, was Cardinal Ratzinger lying when he said that the whole secret's been revealed? It's all there. You must understand the complexities of the mind of Josef Ratzinger. He's making a not-so-clever mental reservation when he says the whole secret is there in that vision of the third secret explained by Sister Lucia. What he means is very clear. Implicitly, it's all contained there. In that vision, it's contained there. It's not explicitly set forth in the words of the Blessed Virgin. So, in a manner of speaking, it's contained implicitly. The secret is there, the whole secret is there implicitly, not explicitly. And that's the, that's the mental reservation that Cardinal Ratzinger was using. He wasn't flat out lying when he said that, but he wasn't telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth either. you have all these Protestant elements brought into the liturgy of the Mass, all the explicit Catholic elements that were unequivocally Catholic, that offended Protestantism, were, were removed from the Mass, contrary to what was taught by Pope Pius XII, that the, that the liturgy must be an ex explicit profession of faith. but even more serious. We look at the Good Friday liturgy in the New Missal of Pope Paul VI. Look at the original Latin text, and there is no doubt whatever. The prayer for the Jews. In previous ages, the Roman liturgy, the traditional Roman liturgy, the rite handed down by the Church, we pray for the faithless Jews. The liturgy, the Catholic liturgy prays for the conversion of the Jews, that God will remove the veil from their eyes so that they will be healed of their blindness and, and, and they'll accept Jesus Christ. The new missal of Paul VI ask God to keep them faithful in their observance of the covenant. That by this means they'll come into the fullness of the truth. Now, again, what covenant do the Jews refer to as the covenant? It is the Mosaic covenant. 
the old covenant which is made void by Christ. Because they have made it, they have nullified it by their own infidelity. The prophet Jeremiah foretold that the old covenant will be replaced by a new covenant. It is fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And so the covenant, the covenant, all that was perfect and all that was immortal, all that was timeless of the eternal law in the old covenant is taken into the new covenant. Salvation is only in the new covenant through faith in Jesus Christ. The Jews observe the old covenant because they reject Jesus Christ. If they did not reject Jesus Christ, they would embrace the new covenant. But they reject Jesus Christ and therefore in their obstinacy they cling to the old covenant and observe the old covenant the Mosaic Covenant, what they call the Covenant. In the liturgy of Pope Paul VI, the Good Friday liturgy in the Missal, prays to God to preserve them in their observance of the Covenant. This is outrageously scandalous. And it is, it is a heresy to believe that it profits them in any way to, to, to observe the Old Covenant. Because the Church has taught, as is so clearly expressed in the words of Pope Benedict XIV, that the observance of the Old Covenant is a superstition. Because the Old Covenant is no longer in force, it has the rituals, the rites, the prayers of the Old Covenant, have no force, no validity with God, and that to, to observe the Old Covenant is a mortal sin. To observe the Old Covenant is a violation of the Divine Commandment to give the proper worship to God, because the proper worship to God is only one, and that is the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. The Mass and the Sacraments of Jesus Christ are the only fitting worship of God. No other religion. The superstition of the Jews, the infidelity of the Muslims, the perfidious infidelity of the pagans, all of these are abominable in the sight of God. There is only one religion that is pleasing to God, and there is only one religion that confers grace, and that is the Catholic religion. Freemasonry and Jorge Bergoglio are in disagreement on this point. His faith is not our faith. We are Catholics. Jorge Bergoglio has a different faith, a different religion but we see it already being voiced in the liturgy of Paul VI with the prayer to God to preserve the Jews in their observance of the Old Covenant. And the error that the Old Covenant is not evoked is taught in the New Catechism, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. under the supervision of Cardinal Ratzinger. It was announced in the, in the synagogue of Mainz, Germany, 1980, by Pope John Paul II. He stated that the Old Covenant is not revoked. These doctrines are heretical. But we see something different about Bergoglio than we see in Wojtyla and Ratzinger. 
In Bergoglio, the man who says, I do not believe in a Catholic God. Look at his writings, his discourses, the way he talks about revelation. He doesn't believe in a transcendent God. He doesn't believe in the Christian God. He doesn't have a Christian notion of God. He has a Masonic idea of God. I don't care if he's a member of the sect of Freemasonry or not. If he's not, if he's not an initiated member of Freemasonry, he is at the very least what the Masons call a Mason without apron because he believes what the Masons believe. His religion is ecumenist. His religion that there is salvation in all religions. You follow your conscience and do what is right. That's how you get saved. Not by believing this or that creedal formula. You see this in the pronouncements of Jorge Bergoglio. This is what he's always been teaching, what he's always believes. It is so foreign to the Catholic faith. When we profess the act of faith, we say, we pray to God and say, I believe every, all that you have revealed in scripture and tradition and what has been set forth by the church for us to believe. And we believe first and foremost that without this faith we cannot be saved. Bergoglio says, you believe what you think is true, you do what you think is right. Avoid what you think is wrong, that's enough to be saved. That's the doctrine of Freemasonry. The doctrine of a dogma-free Christianity. You may believe in Jesus if you like, but don't you insist that other people must believe in your dogmas. Respect their conscience. This is the doctrine of Freemasonry, not of the Catholic Church. That's what the Freemasons call the religion that all men can agree on. We must all agree to disagree, but all agree that we can all be saved. What is most unacceptable to Freemasonry is what they call exclusivism. That one religion excludes other religions from salvation. And the dogma that is most offensive to Freemasonry is the solemnly defined dogma that outside of the Catholic faith, outside of the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. So one must at least implicitly have the disposition and will to become Catholic. One must in, at least implicitly the will to become Catholic. That if one were to know that the Catholic Church is the true Church, one has to be willing in his soul and his will to embrace that shape. And, and, and one must embrace it to the extent that it is known. One must have the resolve to become Catholic. If it's not, if it's not possible to be baptized, if a person is dying and there's no possibility to be baptized, one must at least have the resolve, must have faith, one must have the faith, and one must have repentance and the resolve to be baptized. This is what the church teaches. It's so clearly taught. It is infallibly taught by the church. Century after century, the ancient martyrs were saved because they professed Christ, even the ones who couldn't be baptized in time, like St. Emerentiana and, and several others. But without faith, it is impossible to be saved. It is Masonic doctrine that you just follow your conscience and do what you think is right and believe what you think is true. Focus on what unites us but do not divide with your dogmas. That's, that's Freemasonry. Examine very carefully the speeches, the discourses, the writings, of Jorge Bergoglio, his doctrine is not the doctrine of the Catholic Church, it's the doctrine of Freemasonry. So this is where we must 
avoid the great deception, that which is the operation of error, to use the words of St. Paul, the operation of error, which is the working of the mystery of iniquity. What do we believe? Back to Shaykh. I believe everything that God has revealed in Scripture and tradition and what the Church has infallibly set forth to be believed. That's what we believe. Why do we believe it? Because it is infallible. Because the Church in her dogmas is infallible. Why is the Church infallible? Because God is almighty. God has the power to infallibly reveal. God, who is the infinite truth, can neither deceive nor be deceived. And because he is infinitely powerful, almighty, it is within his means easily to reveal mysteriously by the, by the means that he chooses through the, through the mouth of the prophets and the apostles and through the divine voice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The infallible sacred tradition which transmits to us the dogmas of our faith. That, to use the words of Saint Irenaeus the Martyr, that alone is true. That alone is true. What has been taught is followed by the Church, the faith of the Church, the faith of the Holy Roman Church, outside of which as the fourth ladder, the fourth Lateran Council under Pope Innocent the third son of his best, professed, outside of which there is no salvation. It's not enough that a pope says this or that. Wrong teachings started after the Second Vatican Council with Pope John the Twenty Third in Pacem in Terris. The papal, the, the, one of the papal theologians was a uh, Dominican father, Luigi Chatti, later became the papal theologian, Cardinal Luigi Chatti, spotted an error in the text of Pacem in Terris. And he pointed out the error to Pope John XXIII, and the scandalous response to Pope John XXIII was, but the whole document is so good, we'll just leave it the way it is. As if one error is not one error too many. That alone would disqualify such a man from sainthood. Pope Paul VI introduces condemned errors Ecumenism so forcefully condemned by Pope Pius XI and Mortalium Animos. The heresy of religious liberty, infallibly condemned by Pope Pius IX, condemned by Pope Gregory XVI, condemned by Pope Leo XII. And he introduced these doctrines into the non-definitive, non-infallible teaching of the Second Vatican Council. The proposed changes in the liturgy in Sacrosanct and Concilium violate what the Church has solemnly and infallibly taught about the liturgy. The Council of Conscience, Session 39, the Council of Trent, in the Solemn Canons, several of them especially canon on the sacraments in general, session 7, canon 13, in the Tridentine Profession of Faith of Pope Pius IV, repeated again by the First Vatican Council. The Church teaches that, as Catholics, we are bound to the traditional rites, the rites handed down to use the solemn formula of the Council of Constance. The, the traditional rites, the rites handed down, that's what tradition is, handing over, handing down. And so it is infallibly defined by the Council of Council, by the Council of 
the Council of Constance. The Council of Constance Anthology teaches under Pope St. Martin V that the Church and the Pope particularly is bound to the liturgy, to the rites handed down, the right handed down. And that's where the Council of Trent infallibly prescribes adherence to the, the, the received and approved rites customarily used in the solemn administration of the sacraments. And when the reform of the liturgy was proposed in the 1700s at the Pseudo Council of Pistoia, Pope Pius VI in Octorum Fide condemned the condemned that proposition, the proposal to change the liturgy along the lines which in fact were adopted by the Second Vatican Council to simplify the rites, to, to have them pronounced in a loud voice, in the vernacular language. This is what was proposed in Sacrosanto Concilium, and that very self, those three things were condemned by Pope Pius VI because they are not in conformity with the order of the liturgy received and approved by the church. That's the phrase he uses. The order of the liturgy received and approved by the church. But because the new doctrines of ecumenism and religious liberty, and that the idea that the Jews should continue worshiping according to the observance of the old, of their covenant, the Mosaic covenant, in order to, to remove the contradiction the Vatican, Second Vatican Council teaching these doctrines and the liturgy of the Mass condemning those doctrines, they reform the liturgy and so the new liturgy is now in conformity with the new teachings of Vatican II. And so in order to bring that about, Pope Paul VI, before he published a new missal, published the new order of Mass and through the sacred con uh, congregation of the rites, there was promulgated Ordo Mise, Order of Mass. And this is why it's called the New Order of Mass, Novus Ordo, because it is a new order of a new rite. Paul VI declared on the 19th of, of November, 1969, there will be introduced into the liturgy of the Latin Church, of the Latin Patriarchate, a new rite of Mass. It's not the Roman rite, it's a new rite of Mass, because it's a new order of Mass. It's contrary to what Pope Pius VI called the order of the liturgy received and approved by the Church. What Pope Pius IV solemnly professed as the Catholic faith, adherence to the received and approved rites, because the Council of Trent solemnly pronounced anathema that anyone should dare to say that the received and approved rites customarily used by the Church can be changed into other new rites. This is solemnly condemned as heresy to propose that this can be done, that it's permissible to change the rites into new rites. Yet this is exactly what Pope Paul VI announced. He said, we're introducing a new rite of Mass. And in the same discourse, he said on that same day, 19th of November, 1969, we used to believe, we used to believe that the liturgy is the untouchable expression of our authentic religious worship. We used to believe? We no longer believe? How can we no longer believe that it is the untouchable expression of our worship? It is solemnly and infallibly professed that the rites cannot be changed into new rites. It is solemnly professed and taught by the Council of Constance under Pope St. Martin V that the Pope is bound. The Pope himself, especially the Pope, is bound to the right handed down. The received and approved rights are the law of God. 
And that's why Pope Pius V in quote primum points out that the liturgy in the Missal, he has restored the liturgy to its purity. He has restored the Roman rite. He, Pope Pius V did not make a new rite of mass. He codified the rite that, goes, that was developed down through the centuries, slowly developed into its perfection. And then when, it, when new growths came into it, he trimmed those excesses out of the liturgy, restoring the liturgy, the Roman liturgy, to its purity. And he said this, in quo primum, that which has been handed down by the Roman Church. That's the important phrase, what has been handed down by the Roman Church. Because the Council of Constance protested solemnly and entirely that the Pope, the Church, is bound to the right handed down. So we have this continuity that went from the right that grew out of the apostolic traditions. St. Paul speaking precisely of the liturgy when he says that the, the Lord took bread and pronounced, This is my body, etc. The first liturgy celebrated by Jesus Christ our Lord. And St. Paul says, and this is the doctrinal position of the church, St. Paul says, I have handed on that which I have received. I have handed on that which I have received. Because those are the words of the Apostle. The Council of Constance infallibly teaches that the church and the Pope are bound to the right handed down. You can't remove the rights and change, re remodel them into new rights. That is against the Catholic faith. It is heresy to even say that you may do this. Section 7, 10, and 13 sacraments in general, Council of Trent. If anyone says that you can do this, they cease to be a member of the church, they become a heretic. You cannot even say that this is permissible. But that's what Pope Paul VI did. He changed the rights into new rights. How this was brought about? Well, the men who changed it. Father Joseph Gelinot. S.J. Explained in his work, published in 1976, Dermé Lanetouji. This is one of the principal architects of the new right of Paul VI. He says, to tell you the truth, the Roman right no longer exists. It has been destroyed. And he explains the whole structures were removed and replaced. Father Anibale Brunini, one of the supervisors of the, of the putting together the composition of the new mass, the new rite of Paul VI, says it is a new creation. In his preface to the work, The Reform of the Roman Liturgy, by Monsignor, Cal Monsignor Klaus Gamber, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger <coughs> explained in the preface, he quoted the German liturgist Jungmann, uh, where Jungmann explains that the liturgy of the church, meaning the traditional liturgy, was the fruit of a long development. It was a gradual development. As the great English scholar said, David Knowles said, the liturgies are not created, they are, they grow in the piety of the centuries. And Cardinal Ratzinger goes on to say, this is not what we have today meaning the new mass of Paul VI, the new liturgy, the new rite, the Novus Ordo. It is that what we have now is fabricated liturgy, the result of a manufacturing process, <coughs> a banal, on-the-spot product. Cardinal Ratzinger was telling the truth, of course, the men 
who created the new right, they themselves admitted that they created an entirely new right, that they had destroyed the Roman right, they made a new creation. Father Carlo Braga and the Father Lengeling, they, they also went on to explain that the new Mass expresses a new Eucharistic theology. A new Eucharistic theology? A new doctrine about the Eucharist? It's a Protestantized liturgy, that's what they mean. When Cardinal Ottaviani and Cardinal Bacci presented a critical study of the, of the new Mass to Paul VI, one of the things that is explained in that critical study is that the new Mass no longer uh, expresses the Eucharistic doctrine of the Church taught by the 22nd section, 20, session 22 of the Council of Trent. It is truly a new Eucharistic doctrine expressed in, in the new Mass. A new Mass that has been Protestantized for the sake of ecumenism to unite, to unite religions, not to unite all men in one faith, but to unite all religions in one ecumenical church. That is the mystery of iniquity. Pope Pius X, Saint Pius X, warned in his apostolic letter, Notre Charge Apostolique, that they would institute a one world religion. And this is the stated plan of Freemasonry a one world religion a religion that all men can agree on, a re religion without dogmas, a Christianity without dogmas, that Christianity has to be re reformed, and reformed into a new religion that has no dogmas, no definition saying you must believe this. If anyone says something different than what we teach, let him be anathema, let him be condemned. This is the way the Catholic Church has taught down to the ages. The Articles of Faith we must believe under penalty of damnation. We are excluded from the Catholic Faith if we dare to reject what the Church proposes authoritatively and defines that we must believe. This is this idea of dogma of faith is what Freemasonry considers to be the most dangerous thing in the world. That's why in the London Times, there was the editorial some years ago. You'll find the precise reference in my book, The Mystery of Iniquity, where they say it's, it is not Islamic militancy that the, 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 that's the real threat to, 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 uh, to peace, to world peace. What the real threat to the human race is dogma of faith. That's the real danger. Dogma of faith. Now, what religion uses that phrase, that expression, dogma of faith? Of course, it's the Catholic faith. Dogma of faith, that comes straight out of the Catholic vocabulary, the teachings of the Catholic popes down through the centuries. Our religion is the religion of dogma of faith, the infallible, defined truths revealed by God as we profess in the act of faith everything that God has revealed in sacred scripture and tradition and what the church has set forth infallibly for us to believe. That is dogma of faith. The Freemasonic publications say that is the great danger to the human race. That has to be stamped out. Dogma of faith is the danger. And so how do we make the world safe for a one world democratic religion, we have to outlaw dogma of faith. We have to outlaw exclusivism. We have to have and only allow a religion that is tolerant, that is a dogma free Christianity. But a dogmatic Christianity, the Catholic faith, which infallibly professes and defines that there is no salvation outside the Catholic faith, 
according to Freemasonry, that religion must be stamped out because that is the religion of the transcendent, almighty, revealing God who reveals specific dogmatic truths and mysteries, divine mysteries and reveals specific commandments that we must obey and we must believe in those divine mysteries to be saved and we must obey those commandments to be saved and those who refuse to believe and those who refuse to obey well our Lord Jesus Christ himself said he who believes will be saved he who does not believe will be condemned and this is why our Lord said I did not come to bring peace but to bring the sword I did not come to unite but to divide this is the ongoing war it continues from Old Testament to New Testament down to our present day it is the war between God and his followers the children of God who are through the redemption by Christ and through the divine maternity of the mother of God the mother of all men the war between the ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan the devil and his seed make war against the woman and her seed Jesus Christ and those who are united to him in faith so this shows us the way out there is that light at the end of the tunnel and that light is her she is that star of the sea that leads us into the safe harbor to the desired port to use the words of the psalm when she appears in Sodom you see on her dress that star Our Lady of Fatima she wears the star what does that star symbolize what does it signify it signifies her she who is the star of the sea she who leads the faithful to that desired port which is heaven who leads us through the stormy sea that threatens the bark of Peter to destroy it it cannot be destroyed even though the great mystery of iniquity would, pre would present visibly before the eyes of the human race a counterfeit religion a counterfeit church that is Catholic only in name Saint Athanasius said even if the faithful of Jesus Christ are, re are reduced to a handful that is the true church of Jesus Christ another ancient father Saint Vincent of Lerens said what is the Catholic to do when it appears that not just a portion of the church but that some contagion is to poison the whole church at once so someday when it appears that the whole church is defecting into heresy what does the ancient father tell us to do he says hold fast to antiquity what do we receive from antiquity St. Athanasius had the formula the actual original faith teaching and tradition of the Catholic Church which the Lord bestowed the fathers uh, which the Lord bestowed the apostles proclaimed and the fathers safeguarded and it is the mother of God through, through the graces by accepting to be the mother of the Redeemer she becomes spiritually the mother of the redeemed and she is the one who generates us in the life of grace by giving us by giving to the world and by meriting to be the mother of God she through her consent gives us the Redeemer gives us the redemption 
So she is that star. Symbolized mysteriously by Esther in the Old Testament, she who saves her people. Esther, the word means star. Our Lady of Sodom wears that star on her dress because her immaculate heart will triumph. And she, by the graces she will obtain for us through her mediation with her divine Son, will bring us to salvation. And so she says, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. Yeah.